Hey guys, welcome to this new video. Recently, I've been sharing about how did I build my plan B. And today, I invite an expert who builds portable businesses and recession bulletproof strategies. So today, with Emil, we're going to discuss about how important is it to think global and local and all her insights about that. Let's get started. Hi, Amel. Uh, I'm very happy to have you here today on the YouTube channel to discuss about your journey going overseas as well as your experience being an entrepreneur. So can you maybe start by introducing us, like, who are you, where have you been, and where are you right now? Thank you, Guillaume. It's a pleasure to be here with you and all of you watching. My name is Amel, Amel Deregui. To introduce myself on the personal side, so I'm... Um, I'm Algerian, I'm Algerian, became Austrian by marriage, born in India, and I define myself as a global nomad. I've been raised by my parents living from a country to another, and in my 20s, I decided to settle for a bit in France, where I've built my career in advertising. I've also worked a bit in the U.S. Um, in sales and marketing and studied there. And um, by the time that I have, was ready to settle down in France in my Ad advertising agency career. I've actually went to visit my parents in Iran, met my husband there, and a year later I quit my career in advertising, joined him in Iran, and that's when I started my career as an entrepreneur. I started a business and I had I figured out that there was, my husband has a job that takes him from a country to another as well. And uh, I knew that I would never be able to find a job every time we keep moving from a country to another. So for me, entrepreneurship was just like a necessity it was not even like a choice there was no other way although I always wanted to have my own business someday I just arrived much earlier than I thought so yeah I started consulting for in marketing strategies for big corporations uh, and I've been doing that in Iran and then uh, slowly slowly kept doing that from a country to another we'll talk about what happened during that time and um, and if Five, six years ago, I've also been uh, looking at the journey of me developing my business on the go and how to make it portable and all the challenges that I had along the way. And I met very few people who actually I had a lot of really great mentors who tried to help me, but all of them were set, settled in one country. I didn't have the challenges of what having a portable business that what I call a portable business came with. So, um, so down the road, I started a podcast to talk about this and uh, that led to creating uh, Tandem Nomads, which is the company that I lead now. So I've moved from corporate consulting to helping actually global nomads like me build their portable businesses through coaching, online courses, and other online programs. Interesting, Amel. So I feel that even in your roots, you have already that kind of uh, globalism, right? And then uh, a little bit of uh, a lot of uh, country kind of probably provide you some some influence and how finally you decided to, to become like citizen of the world somehow. We're going to go a little bit more in the portable business and what you, you mentioned uh, right now. But before that, can you come back, uh, Amel, about what happened in Iran when we uh, first uh, had a call uh, with each other? You, you share with me uh, what happened over there and how it was kind of the day click like that uh, show you how important is it to be at the same time local and at the same time global when we want to move overseas. So I'm going to step back one thing about Iran that I was really excited about. And I think emerging countries are all in that way. There's so many opportunities in emerging countries because compared to the Western world where I used to live, the market was saturated with people in my field. And, and um, I just find that emerging countries are just amazing opportunities to be more creative, to come up with even more innovation sometime. So I was really excited to be in Iran and I saw so many opportunities and it actually turned out to be really great for me. It, um, I've developed my network there and managed to actually have some great big projects there. Um, so I was... I was really excited with the opportunities I got in, in Iran. The thing that happened to me was <laughs> that there's two challenges that I have um, encountered. The first one I could see for coming very quickly, which was I knew that I was not going to be in Iran for many years. So is when we developed the network in Iran, the clientele in Iran, I had to think of what if I have to leave? How I'm going to do 
to keep working with these clients. And actually that exactly what happened to me was that um, along the way, I got some big clients and I actually couldn't keep going back and forth to Iran because of visa issues, security issues and other things. Um, so basically I had to give away one of my biggest clients to somebody who didn't work as hard as me um, to, to get it. So that was the first issue that I encountered. But the other one was also um, one of the, my biggest contracts. Actually, I lost 70% of its value due to the devaluation of the currency, which happened suddenly from, honestly, from a day to another due to uh, some new sanctions that were implemented for Iran. So um, being paid in local currency was a huge issue as well, that being a global nomad and also having ties to other countries, Western countries, makes it very complicated. So that also is another thing that triggered me to think more long term and think about my business model and how can I make it not so dependent on the local country as well. I relate a lot to what you mentioned about uh, emerging countries and the opportunities that are out there. And if we come with a, a foreign background, uh, a little bit of uh, maybe creativity and maybe still be a little bit of risk taken, uh, I guess there are probably more opportunities to be uh, taken uh, either in Asia or either in other countries uh, that are emerging. Uh, but on the other side, we have also the, the pitfalls, right? And the, the traps that we can fall into. And maybe the devaluation of the currency was uh, one of the things that we may not have in mind when we go kind of all in in a country. And uh, I remember the first time we discussed together, you kind of shared me also your vision of when you move overseas, uh, you want to somehow be a little bit local and a little bit global. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, that concept of being, you know, like, or somehow getting the best of, of each pieces. So this was my quest for the past 10 years. I've been looking, and remember, this was in 2010, 2011, when not so many technologies were available and not so many tools were so affordable for small businesses like us. So um, from very early on, I was thinking, how can I make sure that my business doesn't doesn't only depend on where I live? And that's where I started this whole journey of portable business. And one of the things year after year that I had to develop, especially as I started working with clients to help them build their portable businesses, I try to develop a model that I could replicate to explain actually the concept, which I call now the 60-40% model, which is, um, which is basically making sure that at least 40% of your revenue doesn't depend on the country where you live. Ideally, it's 60%, but if you really want to have like a majority local business, then I always, especially as an expat, um, make sure that at least 40% of the revenue is actually coming from a source that's digital. So um, maybe I can give an example, if that yeah. helps. Yeah, go, go ahead, Amel. So um, I'm going to give a very simple example. It might not fit to all the type of clients and those of you who are watching, but I think it's a good example to simplify. So for example, let's say if you are a yoga teacher, you can teach yoga anywhere in the world, right? Uh, and especially in Asia, it's such a great place to actually get um, accustomed to yoga. But um, yoga, once you arrive, you have to create your own like network, your own set of clients. But let's say you have to leave then you have to start again from scratch. So even if the skill is portable, the business itself is not portable. And we could apply that to graphic design, for example. We could apply that to many other developers, for example. So um, in case of yoga, what I, I had actually clients who are yoga teachers was to develop some revenue streams that are not dependent on the country where they are. For example, digital courses, um, for other things that's really work as affiliate partnerships, marketing affiliate partnerships. That is, for example, let's say as a yoga, you can work with strategic partnerships who have the same clientele, but very different offer. Let's say essential oils, for example, or mats or equipment for yoga. So you could partner with them and then you, because you have access to the clientele who needs all of those things, you could have a percentage of the sales to every client you sell one of those. So there's a lot of things that you can develop to, um, to actually 
diversify your revenue, first of all, because that's important as a business to diversify your revenue streams, but also make sure that you build an audience that's not only dependent on the country where you live. And even if it's on, dependent on the country where you live, you could still serve them if you had to pack your things and go at some point. Actually, I made another uh, video very recently that you can have a look here that is how to think global while moving to Asia. And it's really relating what you were just mentioning by the fact that when you come to Asia, sometimes you may face that change, right? So if you really want to settle in a place, then maybe you will uh, want to involve at uh, a very early stage some uh, upfront cost just to set up a company, for instance, and that company can help you to build a team, to get a proper and legit uh, visa situation. But at the same time, you need also to think global. And because we are expats, usually we don't really have all the social care behind. So we need to have our uh, own health insurance. Uh, if we want to invest, uh, we may want to prefer uh, offshore investments. Uh, I don't know, you can invest in the US, for instance. So I really like your vision of trying to uh, demultiply and, and and use the best of, of each country with that rule of the, the 60-40. So I, I kind of relate with this, uh, Amel. Uh, uh, but now, uh, what maybe question we can go a little bit more, more, more dig into. It's what about your portable business? You mentioned it a little bit like, what would be the advantages for you to have something that is like, as you say, portable? So we can imagine that the business in, is in your backpack and if for instance, your husband uh, changed to a new country, you can just easily follow him now. Um, what other advantages do you see in that portable business? So you, you described it very well in this example, for example. Um, the first one is obviously to be able to, it's a lifestyle thing, first of all. Um, I always say that once we expatriate one time, we expatriate always. Usually one expatriation leads to another. And even if it, that doesn't happen, let's say you do settle and then that way you're kind of immigrating to the country. Um, usually we always keep our ties back home, right? And I can see it, for example, in terms of family, if you need for an emergency reason to go and stay a longer time with the family or even for happy things too, you need to, to be able to, to leave you can do it without having to stop everything in your business and you can still manage it from, from afar. And that's for me a huge lifestyle benefit, but also in a more economical and more business aspect, we live in a world where we need to be super, super flexible more than ever before. And the portable business was something what I used to talk about so much before um, to convince people of its advantages. I think today it's much easier to understand how a portable business can really help pivot much faster than when we have a business that's very physical and very dependent on the location where we live. Um, so that flexibility is something as well that is not just about lifestyle, but also as a business strategy that I think is really important to build today, an agile business and portability is something that can really help with that. Yeah, and, and I guess it is also what happened in during this COVID time, right? Many companies who were ready before having some somehow online visibility or were having already a, an e-commerce website, having some sales that they could just do online, and other businesses that were fully offline and that really suffered and, and were maybe the most impacted during this crisis, right? We just think about tourism, right? All the companies related about tourism uh, got, got maybe their revenue divided by, I don't know, uh, 99%. But uh, someone who was maybe already, as you mentioned before, the yoga teacher, maybe who already have a website, she could more easily switch to something online, uh, ask all her, her students to move online and maybe just it's a way for her to, to do something with some innovation, right? Like it's maybe COVID, everyone is stuck at home. So let's do some yoga class. Maybe you do it for free at the beginning. And then after you find a way how you can monetize uh, something that you build online. Uh, so quite interesting. What about the, the, the recession aspect? Do you think uh, Amel does kind of businesses maybe more recession proof and being able to survive? There is, I don't know, a big, big crisis uh, worldwide? Definitely. I mean, we've seen it during the peak of the pandemic, how most of the companies who actually either, either managed to pivot or actually to thrive were those who had some kind of digital components, either already ready or those who were very, very willing to 
flip and switch and pivot very quickly to offer their digital solutions. So I think this is really an amazing way to um, to be recession proof is to have a digital offer. Um, and you know, the one thing that I also want to talk about real quick before I go back to the recession is also the time we live in. We live in such an amazing time that we have access to so many more resources nowadays to be able to create a recession proof and a portable business. Um, for example, let's talk about e-commerce real quick. E-commerce is something that I know is very interesting in Asia because there's a lot of sourcing in, in Asia, a lot of great products that we can sell globally through sourcing the product in Asia. And this requires most of the time a huge heavy uh, infrastructure and, uh, and managing stocks and managing inventory and things like that. And today, thanks to drop shipping, so if you ha haven't heard ever of drop shipping, um, I would invite you to do more research about it. But just to summarize it real quick, you have a lot of online platforms today that help you have an e-commerce where you don't have to manage any of that. All you have to do, your job, is to attract the clients to your website and the drop shipping companies manage the whole logistical aspect of, uh, of transport, of delivering the product and, and et cetera, supply and demand chain, basically. So we live in a great time where this is possible. But now, thanks to COVID, one of the barriers that has fallen um, that we had, because these tools existed before the pandemic, what happened thanks to the pandemic is the shift of mindset. First of all, of the entrepreneurs, the, most of the entrepreneurs I used to work with or were in touch with who were resistant to going digital um, suddenly so <laughs> that there was no more choice, right? So they could see how all those resistance and arguments that they had to not do it were suddenly not valid anymore in the opposite. But even more important, what I've seen is a shift of consumer behaviors. Um, I, even with the clients that came to me, they were ready to shift to digital solutions. They they sometimes have the issue of having clients who are not ready to consume certain products digitally. And I'll give you some examples later that are quite fascinating. But today, thanks to the pandemic and how it changed the behaviors of the consumers, more and more consumers today are actually not as resistant to consuming certain services or certain products online that they didn't used to. For example, doctors. I've actually had my, my doctor who was an anti-digital solution type. I remember I was asking him if he would be willing to take me on a call or on a video. And I was like, what are you talking about? And during the pandemic, since then, I've never seen him face to face again. So um, and that's just a huge change. Like you could actually have a medical consultation online, for example. So um, and this is a huge shift. So if you were hesitant now, the first thing is looking at in terms of mindset, what are the barriers that are stopping you, the beliefs that are stopping you from doing it, but also realizing that today it's your chance um, more than ever to go full on because you don't want to wait until everybody wakes up for sure, although this is just already the present right now. But maybe one question I have for you, Amel, is that is yeah. any business can move and become a possible business or is there some kind of, I don't know, verticals where it's, it will be harder for them to to move online and to have something like flexible, as you mentioned? I actually, I can give you some amazing examples of businesses you would think would not be poss possible to be portable, and they are. I have, for example, a client who is a, so it, and even in English, we say dressage expert. So dressage is the, the art of training a horse for competition and, and is those a special way to move their bodies and to incline their heads and their legs and everything. And this is something very physical. You need to be with the horse. And with my clients, we managed to actually build the business that is completely virtual. So, and before the pandemic, that would have been a bit harder. It was actually, she was already doing it before the pandemic, but after it just became so much easier. But the way she does it is to create virtual plans. She has Zoom, she has digital videos, and she has actually some digital tools like uh, certain apps that she used to be able to create a dressage plan for, their, for her clients. And um, in worst case scenario, if the client needs some direct help, she goes on WhatsApp 
and does a, a call on the field with the client. So you can see how even such a physical business, I have, for example, interior designers who managed to turn their businesses into a portable business. I have a virtual midwives as well, midwives who actually managed to build support for pregnant mothers through a digital solutions. So I do believe it's all possible. And if there are some aspects of the business is really hard, go back to that 60-40% rule of revenue streams so that even if something, some parts of your business are too dependent on the local aspects, still develop something that can be digital. For example, this virtual midwife has a lot of online courses, group coaching, one-on-one coaching on Zoom, and but she also has a VIP package where she actually flies in whenever a client wants her physical presence. So that's a VIP package and she that is not portable, but but it provides her still, she also has other products that allows her to not only have to fly all the time or be with her clients all the time. Okay, They're very interesting, Amel, the example that you share. Yeah, I wouldn't believe that someone that like with this position could be able to make it portable. So I think it's a pretty, pretty interesting example. So I really agree uh, with you, Amel, that going online and having some kind of presence and being able either to have a website, a Facebook page, or at least kind of put some online actions uh, would be good for, for the long run. Uh, what would be for you the, the three components that businesses need to implement if they want to like launch and have a kind of online presence? Yes, this is an important question in terms of implementation, how we bring this to reality. I think one of the, um, the, the three components that I help my clients with, I had to find a way to, to also help them understand the concept of how to attract the right clients. And working with so many people, I noticed there is when a business struggles or succeeds, it's always about these three important C's. So the first one is clarity. We need to have clarity around the foundations of the business, the target audience, the niche, the business model, the market potential, and all of that. So clarity is number one. Number two is consistency. A lot of people, when they start a business, they try a lot of different marketing strategies, try to go all over the place. And it's really important to actually sit down, do the market research, understand what are the key metrics that are important in your business, and then be consistent with those instead of trying too many different marketing strategies. And this is really important. Obviously, consistency is also important in terms of quality of the service or the product you deliver. Um, It's just like when you go to a restaurant, if you go... Uh, one time you love it and then come back and it's really not as good for the same dish, then it would be hard for you to go back a third time, right? So um, it's important to think about the business systems as well and the systems behind the business to stay consistent. And the third one, which is key, is also conversion. So once we are clear, clear on the business foundations, then we are consistent with our implementation. Then we have to look at conversion. What is converting? What is not converting? And so that obviously you can really meet your business goals. So these are the three important factors of success of your portable business and any business actually, not just a portable business. But if you want to learn more about that, I think we'll put the link down the video where I go in details with some exercises where you can actually assess your business based on those three C's to see where you need to work in order to improve you know, your business or even launch your business. So I'll, I'll make that available for you. And what about, let's let's talk about the people who are following their husband. I know uh, some of my customers, they are, or, or just audience, they are, want to move to Asia and sometimes they have their partner who find a job already and they may not necessarily be able to, to really uh, fit into a new market. Let's say they go to an emerging country. Do you think that having a portable business could be the solution for them? to kind of uh, go with something and having somehow a plan B on the side that they can develop while moving overseas? A hundred percent. Actually, this is how the whole story of Tandem Nomad started. I've met so many partners and spouses of expats who, who actually follow their partners abroad for their jobs or their businesses and couldn't keep up with their careers. Obviously, it's really hard, especially when you start having a family. And um, the reason I started my podcast was 
to be able to, to, to bring awareness around this amazing solution, to be able to create your own source of revenue, financial independence and fulfillment, which is also important uh, while living the expat lifestyle. So 100% a portable business is not only a great way to actually build a sustainable business on the long term, but also to, to be able to have a portable career as an expat partner. Very interesting, Amel. I'm very happy that you could share this today to kind of uh, illustrate another way to think uh, uh, global as well as local while moving overseas. And I'm pretty sure uh, Portable is one of the solution. Actually, when I came to Asia, I had somehow my backup plan and uh, having some e-learning uh, website, some affiliate website was something that I keep on the side. And of course, it helped me uh, to get started and to keep a backup plan here uh, while being in Asia. You have a final word for the audience? I just want to encourage you to keep an open mind, basically, about I know that um, th this can feel very new for a lot of people, or there's also an attachment as well sometimes to the physical aspect. Like, for example, uh, really wanting to have a business around art or art or crafts or something like that. Um, I think that one does not prevent the other. So keeping an open mind and thinking long-term, I think is something really important if you want to succeed on this uh, expatriation slash entrepreneurial experience in Asia. Thinking long-term while implementing short-term is something to think about as well. And always think of a, of a yeah, just like you okay. did, Guillaume, of, of your backup plan. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Amel, uh, a lot for your insight today. I will leave in the description all the links. So if you want to reach out, Amel, or check what Amel is providing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on her podcast and uh, website, you can have a look everything in the description. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you, Amel, and I see you in the next video. Bye-bye. And I'ma get it right, then I'll fight like